Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with basket maker Joe Hogan. Joe lives in Ireland, where he works with willow that he grows himself to make work that spans both traditional craft basketry and contemporary sculpture. Whether you're interested in traditional craft, finding your voice, or working with integrity, there's something here for you. Joe has managed to build a life and develop a distinctive form of expression that are without compromise. And in this episode, we get into his experiences earning a living by making baskets, the benefits of developing work gradually, the importance of authenticity over labels such as traditional or contemporary, and the tremendous creative benefits of spending time in nature. I found my conversation with Joe to be genuinely inspiring, and I hope that you do too. Okay, so uh, my name is Joe Hogan, and I work as a basket maker. I've worked as a basket maker for about 40 years. I started in 1977, so actually it's more than 40 years. And the main reason I got into basket making initially was because I wanted to live in the countryside, and not just any countryside, but the particular countryside I'm living in, uh, Connemara, which is a region of the west of Ireland, Lots of uh, mountain, lake scenery, very beautiful landscape and nice people as well. And um, I could see that uh, basket making would suit to combine with a kind of a slightly self-sufficient lifestyle, which I was very interested in at that time. Um, We still grow a good bit of our own food and things like that. But the big advantage of basket making was that we could grow our own willows. And uh, that's still something that's um, important to me. It's the the integration of, of being able to generate the materials and then transform them into an object. Yes. And initially, that's kind of normally people would enjoy the activity first. But in my case, I think it was more that I, it seemed to be a good fit um, to be able to learn this skill would would be able to generate income. And all of that kind of thing. And it was only gradually as I began to make more and more baskets and get better at it, that the activity itself, if you like, hooked me in, as it were. And I got more and more engaged in it and more willing to spend time to improve. So I think that's something that happens with a lot of craft disciplines, that they kind of slow down. Um, and then I think that can be very helpful because um, in my case, uh, that whole learning of a skill and trying to perfect it, I found it, it had um, implications, if you like, for, for all of my life, really. I found it helpful. How do you mean implications on all of your life? How does it extend beyond the actual making? Well, if we take something, patience, as in not rushing things, if you think about... Um, Commercial basket making, uh, which I kind of did for the first five or six years, you kind of have to make X number of baskets per day. But uh, that's in order to generate an income from it. But even if that is true, you still can't rush it beyond a certain point because um, if you do, the quality will suffer. So it seems to me that... Um, even in that, there's a kind of a little a parable in it, if you like, to take it kind of to be in the moment um, because you can't be anywhere else at that time except just where you are. And um, I think it kind of that way uh, stills your thoughts a lot and things like that. And you just kind of get into it and get into the making and you kind of forget the extra or the extraneous, you know, the outside pressures. And that's a good thing, I think. So, yeah, generally, I think it it grounds you and kind of um, maybe I shouldn't speak for anybody else, but for me, it certainly grounded me a wee bit. Yeah. Do you think that's something that's exclusive to basket making? Oh, I don't. No, I I feel that it's it's true of most work, and it's not just true mm. of craft work only. I think it's um, <clears throat> I think if you um, learn to like what you're doing 
um, I think that can be very good full stop. Uh, so I don't think it's just true of basket making, no. But in my case, it was basket making that brought me to that because um, it was the kind of first work that I had done that I really enjoyed, I think. Um, I had worked as a, as a labourer and things like that, casual work, but I couldn't say that I enjoyed every moment of it. So, yeah, basket making was good for me then. You, you say that it, it, um, you had to be present in the making and almost, uh, shut out the external pressures. How, do, how do you do that? Because I think that's a, a real difficulty for people who are working, particularly in the craft sector, where the finances are generally a struggle because the, the <laughs> work is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And the the general value that other people who don't appreciate the the effort and the expression that goes into making things by hand is is never enough to compensate the maker, or, or very rarely enough to compensate the maker. So there there's often a struggle to continue to do what we love, but make ends meet just in terms of the the d daily expenses of life. So uh, how how did you keep that pressure at bay? Uh, how do you keep that separate from the making? Well, um, I think the thing is that when you, for instance, when you finish a day, you can say, this is what I got made, etc., etc. But I think in the process of making, when you're making itself, I think if you're not kind of concentrated on it, I think that means that you're not making as well as you ought. So I think you kind of nearly need to say to yourself, when I'm making this is what I'm at. I'm not, I'm, and I, in, in my case, I wouldn't have consciously blocked out anything. It was more that I found I needed to concentrate, I think, to do it as well as I could. And therefore, anything that was a distraction at that moment kind of could be shed. Um, but I, Take your point about the financial pressures of craft work. I think that's kind of one of the huge issues for craft workers generally. Um, preventing burnout, first of all, by working too hard. I think everybody needs to take some time away too. And, you know, you mentioned about a creative challenge and things like that uh, in mm -hmm. preliminary things. For me, I think rather than a specific uh challenge or something like that. I think everybody needs to take a few hours each week to get in touch with nature, to switch away from um, commercial pressures, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you could work seven days a week and still there will not be enough time. So sometimes you have to say to yourself, look, I'm going to take a few hours. I'm going to get out there, um, you know, absorb the healing, I think, of nature, um, the way that it can um, calm you, I think. And um, it can also be a great source of inspiration. So um, I'm making work now, which is very, very different to what I did at the beginning. And I'd have never envisaged that. You know, it wasn't a plan or anything like that. But I do feel that leaving yourself open to influences from the natural world. I think it can also, it can be beneficial for yourself, but it might actually, in a strange way, also be beneficial for your work. So if you wanted to call it a kind of, um, you know, how big companies they do, then they have a name for it, I think, R&D. The first time I heard it, mm -hmm. I had no idea what they were talking about, but research and development, isn't it? But I think yeah. on, on a much more basic level, I think craft workers need to, um, <clears throat> if you like, stay in tune with that thing that brought them there into that discipline in the first place, namely the enjoyment of doing it. And I'm sure that you probably know one or two craft workers for whom the whole struggle of juggling, you know, financial pressure, making, and especially if you're making kind of production work where you have to make 
uh, we'll let, let's just say if you were a potter and your goal was to make, say, 100 mugs in a particular day, to you know, to throw that amount of work, it's, I'm sure it's doable. I think the problem is that the repetition of it day after day after day is what often uh, grinds people down. And I think that if you can kind of begin to look at it in another way, that I will do it on my own terms, I will understand that by repeating, 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 I'm honing and improving my skills. But that will only stay true if I'm still charged, you know, if I'm still interested. And years ago, I uh, read, a, that's a telephone call, so I'll just take it off the hook, will I? Okay, if, if sure. Yeah. Yes, just I give can. Give me two yeah. seconds, and I... <laughs> okay. Do, do you know what I'll do? It, it'll ring off in a minute. It'll ring off in a minute. <laughs> and then when it does ring off, I will, um, I'll take it off the hook, because we're not usually here at this hour anyway. Um... No, what what I would feel is that for a lot of people, they can quite easily uh, forget what it was that brought them into basket making, pottery, that kind of thing. And um, I think it's very important not to lose sight of that. So now, Jeremiah, I'm going to pause for a minute. That phone is rung off and I'll just take it off the hoop for two quarters of an hour. Okay, sorry about that. We always take that telephone off the hook when we're eating, but I forgot to oh. offer this. So we never have okay. uh, telephone interruptions for that. So I could do I could have no the same, but I didn't think of it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay. So this, it's fascinating, your um, the things that you're saying, because it, it sounds like you've really managed to stay connected to what it is that you love about what you do. And I'm wondering, were there any points where you felt that you were drifting away from that and you had to course correct back? Absolutely. Oh, yes, for certain. Um, I mean, I think there would have been times where I was completely uh, submerged, you know, the, with the kind of the water over my head almost, um, feeling that kind of pressure. And particularly in my first Six or seven years of basket making, um, I was kind of the sole breadwinner, if you wish, and um, it was it was very challenging. Um, and it was when I began to notice that I was losing the um, the enjoyment that I realised this is something you have, I needed to change something. And I think the biggest thing that I needed to change, because I was wholesaling all my work at that point, was to have a plan for getting. And the problem with wholesaling, I think, is that a lot of the time you underprice work. So in, in effect, I was actually selling to work for less than what I needed to sell for. Therein became a vicious circle because it meant that I was actually trying to make more baskets per day than I was physically able to do, etc., etc. There's a thing on the underside of a functional basket called a foot. It's a, it's where you turn the basket upside down and you put on another border underneath. Um, <clears throat> I'm just using this as an example. Uh, it didn't exist in professional basket making in Britain or Ireland. It existed, weirdly enough, in country basket making people who are making work for themselves or their neighbours. And this is strange because you'd say, this is going to add perhaps eight, ten years to the life of a basket, so why wouldn't it be there? Um, it's not there because people don't know to look for it, if you wish. Um, and, it, I mean, a basket looks fine without it. And there are other strategies that they use. But I decided I want to start putting a foot on my log baskets. And when I was wholesaling the work, uh, people said, by all means, but we don't want to pay extra. And I think that kind of was, a, if you like, an awakening for me, because um, I thought, well, I'm going to force the issue and charge more for it and throw in a 10 year guarantee. 
and ironically it kind of worked you know what i mean it it um they did pay more for it and obviously there's a line beyond which you can't go something can get unaffordable and i think that some craft disciplines that happens more easily than others because they're more labor intensive um but for me i think that that was um that taught me something in other words about trying to work to your own standards and then trying to charge a fair price i think it's quite important to be grounded and realistic and i mean when i say a fair price i think that in one's first few years in a craft discipline it's it's unfair to expect to get paid huge money i know somebody who went and did a, a course you know a financial a one day or two day financial course to about running their own business it disheartened them so much because they heard they should have been earning you know 20 pounds an hour and this is 20 years ago and they thought, well mm. that it was utterly impossible and funnily enough instead of giving them confidence it did the opposite so sometimes i think one has to be realistic about what something will sell for but i also think that if you're working if you're making work that you believe in i think you will have a lot more you'll certainly be able to work longer hours anyway even if you look at it as basically as that you know you'll probably be willing to do more than the average weekly uh time at work if you're enjoying the work itself so i do think there are slight ways around those uh dilemmas but i accept that once there's a machine way of making something then i think it throws into question the slower method you know that's the problem about technology it's not neutral it's it carries with it if you like assumptions that this will be the way from now on and what's i suppose amazing from basket making point of view is it has never been mechanized which is from our point of view amazing i had no idea oh yeah even the cheapest baskets that you see they're just been made by cheap labor but they are all handmade so and that does change the dynamic a little bit because it means that you know say let's say if you're a furniture maker in particular and you you'd like to do some things through hand processes i think the problem a lot of the time is that there is this questioning of well why am i doing this by hand because there is a machine method um so sometimes i think in that sense some of the if you like the the lessons or the insights from basket making mightn't always translate to other disciplines you know? yeah some but some do too i think yeah how, how do you mean some do i mean i think the thing about being involved in the work enjoying it all of that kind of stuff i think that's true ah. for them all yeah yeah wow uh fantastic great i did i was expecting to go so deep into um the business side of, of the work but i think it's it's really important and it is uh i i know from from the conversations i've had with with quite a few makers that it, that it is a a constant source of uh stress and balance uh and concern and it it can strongly affect decisions that people make in the making process that their the product that they're making starts to become informed by a at least a perception of what the market wants Once, yeah it's quite interesting that you've gone the other way or at least you did it at one point with putting the foot the the feet yeah. excuse yeah. me yeah. i don't know what putting the, the foot of that is actually i can't help you on that one. yeah <laughs> I, I assume feet on baskets. Um, yeah. So, but you've you and as as you you said it yourself, you pushed back and instead of taking it as read that they won't pay any more for this the, for the enhancement of the product, mm. you've actually said, well, actually, this is of value to me. I'm going to try at least try. Mm. And it, it fortunately for you in in your case, it worked out. I'm curious to know whether. It because you, you're talking about enjoying the work and separating the or, or trying not to feel the pressure of the finances while making. Have you felt any 
any other any other influences on the decisions that you've made and the kinds of things that you make, like the foot, uh, or the opposite way, that actually this style of basket or this colorway of, of um, willow is uh, I, I can charge more for, or there's a larger market for. Are, are there any other ways that the the finances of the market have influenced? For, for better or for worse, the decisions that you've been making in the making? Not so much. Um, but one of the things going back to, say, the time of putting a foot onto log baskets and things like that, um, I also managed to move onto what we'd say the main road. Uh, others mightn't call it a main road, Um Remoteness is a relative term, I think. But the thing is, if you're up a road, off a road, and off another road, it's very difficult to sell direct, and particularly in a pre-internet time. So I managed to put myself, um, we, to get a, a, a little site where I was on the road and managed to start selling direct. Um, not all of the work, but that also made a difference because of getting, uh, um, what I thought was a fair return. And of course, if you're getting better paid, you also then can take a little bit of time for what I was talking about, um, trying to develop new work. Uh, ideas, I think, emerge in the making process itself, you know, as in you're making something and you think, well, I could do this, that or the other. You know, there are different um, ideas that arise. And a lot of the time, we might be too busy to to apply them there and then. And that's why I'm saying it's quite a nice thing to be able to take some time, maybe a week every year, uh, to just make uh, work that you want to make and that you hmm. are not worried whether it will sell or not sell or stuff like that. Though, of course, in a lot of cases, you might think, especially if there are financial pressures, the motivation might be that I just need some fresh work, you know, that it might actually sell better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think um, certainly in my early years, I made a lot of small things that were cheap for tourists to buy and things like that. You know, um, I think there's a big place for that in everybody's work, especially when they're beginning, because... Um, a lot of craft items are expensive. So I think you need to have some things that are affordable. People might admire a large basket, but that might not be what they'll buy. They might buy something cheap and affordable, if you like, or relatively cheap and affordable. So, I mean, I certainly feel there's a place for um, being aware, I think, that you need things at different price points. Uh, I consider myself being in a very luxurious position now to be able to make essentially what I want to make. But that didn't happen overnight. You know, uh, I'm, I'm making baskets a long time. And I suppose in the last 15 years, I kind of changed direction a bit and started making artistic work. But the irony was that I only started doing that when there wasn't financial pressure on one level. You know, my mm. wife, Dolores, had, had retrained as a gardener, so she got a job as a, a gardener, and our children were grown up, and it just all got a little bit easier, if you like, financially. And then I began to kind of make things that I just fancied making, you know. How how lovely. <laughs> and could you tell us a bit more about what what those are, the the, the artistic baskets, and how they... How they how they're different from the more traditional work that you started in? Um, they're still grounded in traditional work in the sense that there's an indigenous Irish basket called the donkey creel, and uh, I learned that from my neighbour Tommy Hion Tommy. That means Tommy Joyce. Sorry, Tommy Hion Tommy means that his father was Sean and his grandfather was Tommy, and Tommy Joyce on its own wouldn't be any good because there was too many other Tommy Joyces. So that was to distinguish him from Tommy Jimmy Joyce and Tommy James, you see, and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> when when we came living here, I was making, if you like, I had a, a, um, 
an array, if you like, at a kind of um, seven or eight designs, we'll say, uh, a cradle, um, a loud basket, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. None of them were, in any sense, I think, they didn't. They could have been as English as they were Irish, because the professional tradition in both countries is the same, and the professional tradition in Britain is was, I think, one of the highest in Europe. I mean, beautiful, wide borders, good, strong, functional work. But um, almost always with the, with the bark taken off. And hmm. when I came living here, one of the things was I planted willow. The second thing was that I got aware or became aware of traditional indigenous baskets like Tommy's Creel, and within a month, he was down to show me how to make it. It's made upside down by sticking rods into the ground and weaving around it like this. I had never seen such a basket, to be perfectly honest about it. Um, and the other thing is that by, and, and unpeeled, but he didn't dry out the willows and soak them. He made it from what we call half fresh willow, stuff that he had cut in his garden, allowed it to dry for four or five weeks and wove it. The problem with that is that there's a bit of shrinkage. But that was the biggest learning curve for me then is learning how to deal with using natural willow, drying it out and then soaking it and things like that. Um, but that whole thing of growing willow and seeing indigenous baskets, uh, it kind of, it really became a big passion of mine for maybe 10, 15 years and kind of making most of them. And as I'm, as you mentioned, I wrote that book, Basket Making in Ireland, about those kind of things, because I suppose I had begun to teach basket making as well, run courses, and I realized that um, I was big, providing a few course notes, you know, as in this is, if you can't send somebody away and say, well, you got to remember everything, you know. So um, I'd have done a few things like that, and then gradually those course notes began to grow into something bigger and eventually became a book. Um, and that kind of um, <clears throat> experience, if you like, does, ins does inform very much the kind of work I'm making now because a lot of the technical ideas. So I might have been gathering bits of wood for a long time but didn't really have any great ideas what to do with them. But it gradually came into my mind that if you can make a creel upside down, you could make a basket with a collar of wood and you could begin at the wood and you could finish the basket, mm. you know, the, the, on the underside. And, um, that's, and that's the opposite to most traditional basket most, making? Most, most baskets are made with a bottom and then sides and a border. So you begin at the bottom, which seems a very logical thing to do. But these traditional Irish baskets, and although I call them Irish, I mean, certainly Scotland and parts of Wales would have the same tradition of making these upside down baskets. Um, and it was simply that in this region where I'm living, a lot of those traditions had clung on for longer. So people were still using those baskets for bringing down turf for mountain bogs. That was in 1978. By 1988, that had totally and utterly disappeared. In a 10-year period, I think you could say that and the last vestiges of stuff like that were, for the most part, swept away. Um, so it was a particular time to be here and to witness these techniques and it didn't just extend to basket making, it extended to farming as well, where still people were still making cocks of hay. So within, say, 20 mm. miles of here, west of us is wetter, east of us is drier. So there were three styles of haycocks. You know, 10 miles east would be about maybe 10 inches less rainfall. So they had haycocks without covers, which is the kind I would have grown up with further east. And then where this is, uh, we get about maybe 18 inches of rainfall. So there would have been kind of cloth covers on top of the haycocks. And then and it, our neighbours gave us those because, of course, we didn't have them the first year. And then further out, 
they had near Linan, which is wetter still, they had a thing called a tripod, where there's three sticks, and the hay was built on that. The haycock was built on that, because that meant that even if it wasn't fully dry, winds could pass through. And I think there's a lot of that um, regional, I'm very interested in the actual particular place influencing the work. Um, so if you look at, say, indigenous baskets throughout Europe, uh, there are very many regional baskets and they tell you so much about the place itself. So if you see split hazel, you know that it's probably a mountainous region and split sweet chestnut the same. And if you see grasses, you'll usually know it's a dry, arid region, all that kind of thing. And of course, that's changing now. But um, I kind of certainly wanted to reflect some of that in the work I do. And therefore, the rods come from here. And I think the ideas come from the local baskets, you know. Plus, of course, from the pieces of wood, I find. Yeah. And do you find, did you find any sense of, there? there's often a sense of traditions needing to be preserved and anything that challenges or stretches that tradition is uh, almost blasphemy because it's not it's not preserving what was there before and uh, a lot of the baskets that I've seen of your your more contemporary work is um, even to the point of some of them look like they're not even functional. And I'm just wondering if you felt, if you were consciously aware of the fact that you were going so far from that, or if you felt any conflict in taking the form so far. It happened gradually, and therefore it wasn't um, dramatic. Um, I kind of was experimenting bit by bit, and to me, I actually thought it was a small extension of tradition. But yes, um it did drift further from tradition than I had initially intended. But I think you kind of have to follow where the ideas lead you. I don't think you can uh, be too rigid in those matters. And I also think that anybody who, re who regards tradition as static and rigid misunderstands it. And here is a slight bugbear of mine, actually. The use of the word um, cutting edge, breaking the boundaries, that kind of stuff. If you look at, say, there was a British Crafts Council mission statement, somebody sent it to me, maybe from about 2005. And there were furthermore, they didn't say we're not going to represent heritage and traditional crafts anymore. They didn't put it like that. But they did say that they were looking for work which was cutting edge, breaking the boundaries, etc., etc. I found that... Um, I, I just thought it was kind of regrettable because why do you need to exclude in the same way that I don't think traditional people need to exclude contemporary work? I can't for the life of me understand why people who are interested in contemporary work need or feel the need to exclude people who work in a traditional way. But I think worst of all was implicit in that the idea that tradition is a static thing, whereas tradition is always slightly evolving. You know, no two potters will make something absolutely, totally, identically the same. Glazes will change something. You know, people charge everything that they make with a bit of themselves, I think, if it's good work. And that's as true in traditional work as in other work. And I, I think I could understand, for instance, in Britain, why the Crafts Association had to be founded because they were so excluded um, by the crafts organization and by, say, crafts magazine and things like that. I think I think that's a pity. I can't understand why. I, I don't see the need for conflict in those matters. I think you just have to follow where your ideas bring you. And I think if you stay true to that thing, as in, True to yourself, if you like. I, I think it'll come out with an authenticity. That's what I'd be more interested in rather than whether something is traditional, contemporary. I find those uh, 
boundaries don't interest me that much, or those classifications. I'm much more interested in good work. Is it good work? Is it not good work? Is it reflecting? You know, is it honest, authentic? Those are the kind of questions I'm more interested in. So that's a big, long answer. Mm. To cut a long story short, um, <laughs> I didn't really feel I was in conflict with tradition. But it, it happened gradually, Jeremiah, and I think that's that's a big deal because I didn't set out to try to break any boundaries. It just, the work, I found a piece of wood, a particular piece of wood. It was a piece of a beech tree that fell in Clanbor and I had passed on a walk and I contacted the owner to say, could I go out with the chainsaw and take off a few pieces? And there was this beautiful little bump with uh, lichen on it. And when I had that three or four years later, I realized I cannot make a basket from this that will have a hole. You know, in other words, it would have to be a sealed basket. Everything else up to that had been if you like, the possibility of function. There was a small hole. I don't know. It, they weren't functional anyhow. But for me, that was still a big thing to make something which was entirely sculptural. In other words, it was impossible to use. But in a strange way, um, the material dictated it. I had to do it. I couldn't use that material in any other way. So that made the choice easy. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And again, that's that's the, that's the the honesty of the that, that you spoke about earlier is that you're responding to the material as it comes, and that it it sounds like it was inevitable. It had to work that way. Yeah. So I thought that that then made it very easy. You know, it didn't. I didn't agonize about it. I thought, well, that's it. This is what I've got to do. But I wouldn't have maybe that wouldn't have been the first thing I'd have done when I started making those kind of baskets. The baskets that I made at the beginning were much more open as in vessel things, you know, stuff that would contain things and could possibly have been used mm. to throw logs or turf or something into it. But uh, now I don't worry either way. Some of them can be functional. Some of them are not. But I just go with the pieces of wood because that's usually my starting point for those artistic baskets is that I'd usually have a piece of wood or pieces of wood that I might assemble in some way and then I begin from there. That's great because that, that actually leads me to um, some questions about your, your, your working process. What, what are the questions that you're asking yourself as you're, as you're making, either in selecting the wood, uh, the, you know, the materials, or as you're progressing in the making of a new piece? What's going through your mind? What what kinds of things are you are you asking of yourself, or or judgments are you making in the process? Well, I think the judgments a basket maker is always making judgments of have I chosen just the right weavers, etc., things like that. As anyone else is saying, is the clay in perfect condition, or those kind of things. But <clears throat> for me, as I've made more of them, uh, the there's a huge pre-planning stage in basketry, particularly the basketry I do, which is with natural willow. And so I've soaked it for a week and I've also steamed it. The steam is to charge uh, a little bit of heat into them, which means that I might be able to keep the same willow in condition for a whole week, which is means no variation in color and stuff like that. Um, and especially if I'm making a big piece, um, I might know that I'm going to need, it's going to take me the whole week and even at that long, long hours to make something. I try not to make too many of those per year. But sometimes, again, the wood dictates it. If I find an amazing piece of wood, I can't just go turn around and make a small piece from it. So once I'm embarked on the making itself, I at this stage, uh, I, I mightn't, I can't say that I have a totally clear view of how it will look. But at the same time, I have a kind of a rough formed idea, much more so now than say, 10 years ago when I <clears throat> was more, if you like, uh, still trying out this kind of work. I, I'd have a little bit more feeling of knowing where it's leading me. I'm still, you would use that phrase though, where it's leading me rather than where I'm leading it. 
my job, I think, is to try to have mastery of the willow when I'm weaving it. But the shape and stuff is determined by the, the wood and things like that that I begin with. And typically then, once I begin working, uh, it's a question of kind of staying with the material and making sure that everything is in good condition. And, I mean, every time you make a basket, you say to yourself afterwards, was everything ideal? Is there anything I can learn from that experience about how to deal with the material better? You know, things like that. So you might wrap material if you have sunshine coming into your room and various things like that. But in general, um, it's a question of just being there with the process, making it and uh, enjoying it, I hope. It, it, it sounds like you genuinely do enjoy the process. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think most people who who make baskets enjoy it, yeah. Is there scope for, for risk-taking in the work that you do? Yes, but I think there have to be calculated risks. I think, for me, I do, I, somebody asked me to make a, a distorted pod, in other words, a pod out of shape. Um, and rather than kind of jumping in wholeheartedly, what I would have done is I would have taken gradual steps. So I might have made one with a little distortion and then one with more. If that makes sense, I've tried to feel my way. And part of mm-hmm. the reason for that is because I'm spending three or four days perhaps making something, I do not want to waste that time. You know, I, I, I don't want to lose it. And there's no need to lose it because it's a gradual making process. So there's no need to kind of um, throw caution to the wind. There are times, of course, where you could ruin the whole thing. But if you have competence in craftsmanship, that you'd normally say wouldn't happen. So, yes, there's risk taking, but I don't think it's severe. You know, um, sometimes you'll embark on something and you'll know within an hour I'm not too happy with this. And this do, that doesn't happen often. I'd say it's probably happened me twice in the last five years where I've just stopped taking the thing apart and, you know, abandoned that. Something about the project wasn't quite right. Mm. But for the most part, the risks are more calculated risks and they're, again, kind of gradual, as in rather than kind of doing something outlandish, I'd be a believer in doing things gradually, as in test the waters a little bit more, that kind of thing. And that can be quite a journey from A to B in the finish. But it doesn't feel like that because you've done it over Mm. a period of time. And how about play? Is there space for play? Yes, of course. And you know, when I said earlier about even taking a week to try out um, different ideas and things like that, I suppose mm. I kind of, in the early years there, I was trying to make new products, if you like, when I was kind of making functional baskets to sell. But I would feel that everyone should take some time to just engage with the material, you know. Um, it's, and that's nearly more important if there's any sense in which you've lost the connection or the thread. Uh, if if it's not um, if it's not giving you joy, then you certainly need to play. If it's if making process is already mm. giving you that, then possibly your making process is itself a form of play. Yes, absolutely. How how lovely. And kind of the flip of that. Are, are there any things that you do that that aren't with the material that aren't part of your your creative work that you do to help keep you fresh, recharge the batteries, um, give you new inspiration away from the studio and away from the making process. Yeah. Being with nature for me is huge. Um, This is an amazing landscape here and uh, it's, it's very important to me and to my, uh, to my life and I suppose in that sense also to my making process because uh, so I go out and walk in nature a lot. To me, that's huge. And I personally, I would feel that that's probably 
for me where my greatest create source of creativity is nature. Um, I don't know, do you ever hear of an American poet called Mary Oliver? She's quite well known. Um, but she also wrote a small prose book called Blue Pastures. And she herself was, um, she had a difficult childhood, I think. Um, she tells a story about her father just forgetting she was there. And uh, coming back, he had been phoned to say that she was, that he had left her behind someplace. And she said um, he walked in and it was one of the first times she saw him happy because he had forgotten about her existence. So I don't know what that kind of experience did for her. But either way, I, I just reading between the lines, you can see she had a difficult childhood. But she taught herself to write and to write really well. Um, but you were also talking about um, nature itself, that uh, we have no better teacher than nature. That if you look at clouds, the beautiful forms they have. And, and sometimes people think nature is far away from me. But even in a city, you know, there is, I mean, a lot of cities are built on bodies of water. Um, there are usually parks. There are trees. Um, one thing I, I'm um, doing a, a booklet at the minute, just finishing it off on kind of uh, recent artistic baskets. But one chapter is about bark, just tree bark. And there might be 10 photographs of the bark mm. of different trees. They're not, not of the structure of the tree, but just the bark itself. And just maybe like less than uh, a square foot, you know, 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres of the bark. And the variation that you can get, even within the one species, um, I think that kind of um, looking at nature and learning to look and the sustenance that you can get from that, that for me is probably the single biggest thing that informs what I make now. Oh, how how wonderful. <laughs> that was such, it sounds idyllic. Well, it, it can be, but at the same time, you know, it's, you've got to work. And once you make, once you begin a project, you can't be, um, you know, you've kind of got to give it your whole total energy then, I think. But yeah, I think, I mean, I, I work probably a lot more than 40 hours a week making baskets. I probably do maybe more than that, I'd say. I mean, I work at least five days a week, but there might be a few days where I'll just say these are good walking days or, well, of course, this week I was cutting willow, so that has you outdoors anyway. So it's just stuff like that. It's it's nice. And a little variation, I think, is probably good too. Yes, great. Because that actually leads me to another question, which is, and, and I, I know we're getting close to the end of time, so I'll wrap up in, a, in just a few more minutes if you don't mind. That's right, yep. Um, I know that you teach, and I'm just wondering what you get from that that interaction uh, I think I've learned hugely by it. First of all, it clarifies why you're doing things yourself in a particular way. And in my early years in teaching, it also forced me to brush up on aspects of basket making that I might have not been as, if you like, fluent in. So that was good for me. But I think the, the, biggest thing I get from it now, I think, is just the general um, sharing of skills. It's a very nice thing to do. Um, I think you expand yourself in some way when you start uh, sharing skills like that. Um, and of course, people also bring ideas to you. And um, yeah, I just I just enjoy the process. But having said that, I limit the amount of it I do because I might teach max 12 weeks a year. I think that's, for me, enough. One year I did a bit more than that and I just found I didn't have enough time for making my own work and I also found it just physically a bit demanding, you know, tiring. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it very much as a process and I suppose it's also given me, if you like, even because you'd earn probably, certainly back in the day, I would have earned more teaching than 
making at that time. So probably I might have used then some of the earnings of that too to kind of create that time for play, you know, as in trying out ideas, things like that. Some of which would have emerged as a direct result of a course or a teaching experience where people would have kind of questioned ideas or things like that. Mm -hmm. And you thought, well, I've been putting off doing that for a while and I'll do it now. But in general, I found it a very rewarding thing to do. And um, the whole thing of passing on skills, um, I think it's a very nice thing to do, but I think it also clarifies for yourself certain aspects of your making when you're doing that. Mm. Do you make something yourself, Jeremiah? I I do. I work in two different veins. I I um I work as a an actor and a performer, but I for myself I love ceramics. I love working with clay. Okay. Um and exploring all the different wonderful ways that you can work with that material. Okay. Um yeah, I've just, so just a couple more really, well, <laughs> they're very brief questions, but the the answers are as long as you like them to be, okay. is um, how would you define creativity? I'm not so sure that I would define it. Um, I would feel that it is um, charging what you make with the, uh, a little bit of yourself, I suppose. But I think where creative ideas come from um I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I don't worry too much about definitions, so I'm not sure I define it. No. <laughs> not, not that one. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. No problem. Um, but I think that's, uh, yeah, there is something nice about uh, the, the very first thing you said, which is charting it with something a bit of yourself. And I think that's, uh, well, certainly one of the things that I respond to with handmade items is that it is an expression uh, and an embodiment of the maker. And I find that really, really satisfying to spend time with things that, that are handmade versus things that are machine made. No matter how, how exquisitely designed a machine made thing is, inevitably I find that particularly over time, it loses any sense of life. Whereas most of the things that I have, I'm just looking around the house that I'm in right now, my house, and I've got um, bits of furniture and mugs and and uh, things around that that are handmade, and they they almost become richer with use and exposure. And uh, and I, I do think that has a lot to do with the fact that they've been handmade, that there's been um, time and energy invested in crafting that one specific item. Mm as opposed to being part of a, a mass production process. That rings true to me, yeah. Do, and do you think anyone can be creative? Yes. Or is creative? Yes. I think the problem um, is that sometimes creative thoughts are more likely to arise out of the silence. And if you can't create the conditions for creativity, it, then the ideas won't come. But yes, I think everybody is creative. And what do you think those conditions are? A, a degree of stillness, maybe exposure to nature, like I mentioned earlier, those kind of things. Uh, mm -hmm. If, just to mention again, another quote by Mary Oliver, uh, when I first read it, I thought it was a bit harsh. She's saying, poetry is no good in the hives and the dungeons of the cities. Um, they must make the first path uh, to the waterfall. In other words, they must make the effort, if you like. But I, I thought about that kind of observation quite a bit, and I'm wondering, you know, you can get into a kind of a groove or a, a place be, being, being very busy. It actually suffocates creativity. But another thing that equally suffocates it is the 24-hour news cycle, you know, are constantly plugged into a, a TV. You know, it's, it's, it cannot arise if you can't get into contact with your own self and what nurtures it and feeds it. And there, to me, I think that's the, 
it's it's a much greater challenge now than it would have been for people 50 years ago because mm. i think we've we rarely have to spend any time alone and even just from my visits to cities when i go in say to my local town galway uh and i'd go into a coffee shop anyone who's sitting alone is nearly always working on a you know an eye a phone of some sort or things like that and i think we kind of need some silence in our life some quietness and i think creativity is more likely to arise then creative mm-hmm. thoughts i should say yeah so i i suspect that might lead us very neatly into a, a creative challenge for listeners uh, do you have one well if i were to, it would simply be that and i wouldn't frame it as a challenge, I would just say that personally, I think it would be a really good thing for all of us to take at least a few hours every week to go out into nature. Uh, and as, as I said, even a city dweller will find a park or something like that and um, try to do it without, um, you know, switching off telephones and stuff like that so that you're kind of free to uh, get into the experience. I think that is something which is very good for one's creativity. Fantastic. Well, Joe, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for for just taking the time out of, out of your day to to speak with me. Just uh, really quickly, if, there's, if people want to find out more about your work uh, on the internet, where's the best place for them to go? I suppose my website. Um, so it's Joe Hogan Baskets. Joe Hogan, Joe at Joe Hogan Baskets.com. No, sorry, I should know my website. Uh, <laughs> Joe Hogan Baskets. Joe Hogan is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great. I'll, I'll also, uh, put a, put a link on the website on the show notes so people can check it out. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Wonderful. Joe, this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I just can't thank you much. Thank okay. you very Thanks much. Dr. Ryan. All right. Good up here. Bye bye. there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Joe and his work, you can visit The Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of his work and links to other material. And if you'd like to have a go at Joe's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode of The Practical Creative Podcast, It would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or follow me on Instagram, at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm